All right, God bless all of you all that's going to be joining me for this video. This is Sister Liberty, and I'm back in the book of Revelation. We are almost at the end of this book, but I do believe that we are getting into the best part of Revelation. So we are going to be talking about the marriage feast. So going back to the recent videos, we talked about the fall of the nation and not just the fall of the nation, but the end of the world is really what the last few chapters between like Revelation 16 to 18 is talking about. It's talking about the end of the world and the judgment that God is promising to bring on our planet. And so we want to make sure that when he comes, that we are found with the right garments. We are found in uniform. We are found ready to enter into the marriage feast. Because if you do not have on the right garments, then you will not be able to go into the marriage feast. And your garments is a reflection of what's in your heart. So as I was meditating on this, and I'm, I'm getting so excited because when you think about marriage, marriage is a beautiful thing. And I, I think I find it interesting that some people cry when they go to weddings because of the joy that comes with it. You know, it doesn't matter if the people that are deciding to become one are in the will of God, or outside of the will of God. We understand that marriage is a special thing. And it takes two people to agree to come together as one and to commit. And so marriage is beautiful. That's really what the whole Bible is about. It's about God being that reconciled with his people. And so in the beginning, and I know I'm all over the place, but I'm I'm so excited. And so you're just, you're going to have to stay with me and keep up. But, you know, dating all the way back to the book of Genesis, we see that people, Adam and Eve, they were with God. They dwelt with God. They saw God. God was near. God was not afar off. God was not distant. God was with Adam and Eve. More so Adam where God spoke directly to Adam and God gave Adam a job. And so when the serpent beguiled Eve and deceived Eve through eating the fruit that God had told Adam not to eat, that opened the door to sin. And we know that it is sin that caused there to be a breach. It is sin that had caused there to be a gap because the moment they ate of that fruit, their eyes were open. The whole world had changed. Their whole perspective, their whole view had changed on life, the way they saw God, the way they saw themselves. That's why it said they went and they sold fig leaves together because they saw themselves in a carnal way. They saw themselves in an evil light instead of a good light. And so that separated us from God to where Adam and Eve could no longer live in the Garden of Eden. They had to be removed and could never go back again. And so all throughout the Old Testament, the Lord is trying to be back reconciled with his people whom he loves. And They've committed adultery on him. They've committed fornication. They've served other gods. They've rejected him. Um, they've given their hearts to another. And you see throughout the Old Testament, you see the Lord continuously pursuing them. It's kind of like one of those relationships where if I can't have you, nobody can. The only way you're going to leave me is through death. And so even in those times where they would leave God and serve other gods and give their hearts to others, the Lord will cause plagues and, and death and different things to happen. He will allow other nations to overtake them and to destroy them. He would allow their minds to be given over to their own lust. And so he's going after them and he's reminding them of, of what he's done for them and how he brought them out of Egypt and how he got them through the Red Sea. He's doing all of these different things to be back reconciled with his love and when it seems as though it was just not enough, like there was no other option, no other way, he had the ultimate plan. And that was to send his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who we know was God in the flesh. He came from his heavenly place, his heavenly throne to come take on human flesh and to walk the face of the planet, never sinning once in his earthly years. He, he did not sin at all. He was the precious 
blameless lamb of God. And he willfully went to the cross to die for you. And I, knowing that many of us would reject him, knowing that many people would not turn to him, he willfully went to the cross and he bled a bloody death for you and I. And he said, Father, it is finished. And so in that very moment, as the earthquake and the veil tore, in that moment, man became back reconciled with God through his only begotten son. And so you are invited to the marriage feast of the lamb. But Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen. I love how he says that. Because when you think about a wedding, you think about all of those who have gotten the invitation. But everyone that receives an invite is not going to show up. Everyone that gets the invite is not going to come. Jesus talked about that parable in Matthew 22 of those he sent out, his servants that he sent out to invite people to the marriage feast. The parable of the, the I forgot, I forgot the way it words it, but you know, there was a person who wanted to have a marriage for his son. He wanted to have a marriage for his son. And so he went out and he did that. He invited many, but at first, many of those that were invited, they did not want to come because they were busy they had other things to do they had life going for themselves you know just like today people have life going for themselves people are busy people are distracted people are full of the wine of the world and, and so just like in Matthew 22 people are this same way now to to where they are being called they are being invited to the marriage feast the Lord is sending forth the call to come to this marriage feast. This, this is a special event. Marriage is a special thing. That's why God loves it. That's why the word of God says that marriage is honorable in all things. And a marriage bed is undefiled. You know, that, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't give people the, the right to feel, you know, like, see, I knew it. I knew same-sex marriage was, was good because God loves marriage. God created marriage between a man and a woman. That's what the word of God says. So we don't want to confuse the word of God. We don't want to mix God's words and we definitely do not want to misinterpret and say something that God is not saying because if we add or take away to his word, then we will be judged. We will be removed out of the book of life. There will be plagues added to us if we do that. So we don't want to do that. And so this guy, he invites people to come to the wedding and the first group of people, the first wave of people were too busy. And so he told his servants to go out to the highways and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage feast. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It says, um, Matthew 22, verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with gas. So it, was, it was full. It was full. But listen to this. Verse 11 says, and when the king came in to see the guests, he saw that there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, how did you come in here not having on a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, when I first read that, I used to feel like Jesus, that's messed up. Like, that's unfair. That man probably did not have the money to go and get the wedding garments. Like, cut him some slack. But then, over time, as the Lord began to give me understanding of what was actually happening here, if that person, if the, if the case was that they did not have the funds to get the proper garments, they could have opened their mouth and asked for help. A closed mouth does not get fed. And so, they could have gone to a neighbor. How is it that every other person, every other guest in attendance has on the garments? They, they made intentions they put forth the effort to go and get what was needed for this marriage feast you were invited and so you were fully aware where you were going where you were going to be knowing that this was a marriage feast this wasn't just some gathering this wasn't just some basic party this wasn't just you know a celebration of promotion and you know you being a fisherman or you being a comforter this was something great. This was something grand. This was something special that all kinds of people were invited. This was big. And the numbers were not limited. This was this was a broad number of guests. And so this individual, he represents someone who is like the guy with the one talent. Put forth minimum effort or no effort at all. And 
has that victim mentality and feel as though the world owes me. Feel as though God knows my heart. God knows where, I'm, where I stand. God is still working on me. Those are those kind of people. That's what this one God represents. And so that shows us that because his garments were not changed and in alignment to the order and the structure of where he was called to, that lets us know that his heart was not changed, that there was no adjustment in his heart because the garments represents your heart. If there's no change on the outside, so when we get saved and we are born again and we are baptized of the water and of the spirit, then they're supposed to be transformation. Not just on the inside, but on the outside. And not just on the outside, but on the inside. Because we know the Pharisees did a really good job as far as looking, changed, and transformed on the outside. And we know what Jesus said about their insides of how they were full of dead man's bones. They, they, they were dirty on the inside, although their garments were, were clean. And so we know that we can look the part on the outside, but on, on the inside look completely different. And so we don't, we don't want that. We want... What's out on it on the outside to line up what's on the inside and vice versa. And so my heart needs to be changing. If I were a bitter person, if I was a person who was a gossiper, if I was a person I always played victim, if I was a person I've always dealt with anxiety and depression and trusting people and having walls up. Well, the more I grow in the Lord, those things are supposed to be being removed. Just like a stain remover. The Lord is a stain remover. He can remove the stains. He's better than shout. He will, he will get it out. He will get the stain out. And so the more we engage God, the more we interact with God, the more we submit to his ways and the order that he has set up, then the more we are going to be changed from the inside out. And so as our hearts are being changed, so will our garments. Our garments will be changed. Our garments will be changed. And so I know I'm just now getting into it, but it's all piecing together because it, it really is all about us making it into the marriage feast. And so your garments have to be in, apart with where you're going. Your garments has to be in alignment. Your garments have to reflect that you are going to this marriage feast. So Revelation 19 says, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. And this is one of my favorite parts of 19 because there's an actual song with this right here. It says, Alleluia, salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. There is a song. I'm not going to sing it, but I, I really love that song. And many of you, you may know that song. Verse 2, it says, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged her blood. Or has avenged, sorry, the blood of his servants at her hand. We know the great whore was the mystery Babylon. And we know that the mystery Babylon was America. And we discussed the fall of America and the fall of the nation and the influence that America walked in. And so at this point in Revelation, she has been burnt to the core. She has been judged and destroyed. Verse 3, and again they say, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. So, like I mentioned, that's going to be the end of America. Like, America will never be able to be built again. Like, that's going to be the final judgment. That's going to be the final judgment. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. I love that. And a voice came out of heaven saying, praise our God, all you servants and you that fear him, both small and great. It's so funny how I've heard people say that God is not worthy of worship when that's all the beasts in the 24, the 24 elders do in heaven is they, they worship God. They cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They, they worship God. They worship the Lamb. And you have harp, harpers that plays their hearts. There's different types of worship going on in heaven. And so that's going to go on forever. And that's, that's not going to be boring. You're not going to get tired of it. You're created to do it. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. They love it. They do it. They're still doing it. And they're going to be doing it forever. And, some, and so that, that's something to be excited about. Okay. 
It says, and a voice came out of the throne, saying, praise our God, all you servants and you that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reign. Yes, our God is omnipotent. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. That's so beautiful because I get the image in my mind of finally, 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 I finally can be back reconciled with my wife. I can finally have my wife who have kept herself, who has, um, you know, refrained from sin, kept her garments clean, kept her garments spotless, kept herself from being entangled with the wrong groups of people. I can finally have my wife and enjoy her. That's what God desires. That's the whole Bible is him being that reconciled with his first love, which is his people. And so this marriage feast is very special because it's going to be the first time that God is fully reconciled with his wife, with his bride, which is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the glory of God. And so he's going to be with his church. He's going to be with his bride forever. Like there is no short moment or temporary moment. He's going to be with his wife forever. And so this supper, this marriage feast is the beginning of a long-term permanent eternal everlasting relationship where we will be with God and we will see him as he is and we will be his people and so that's why this marriage is special that's why it's different than any other marriage and that's why the guests are just as important as the marriage as well and that's why the garments have to be fit for this marriage your garments have to be right they cannot be what you want them to be they have to Look as though you are fit to be here. And so that's a beautiful thing. And it says in verse 8, And to her was granted that she should array in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So, you know, the church is the bride. The church is the glory of God. That church that is found spotless and blameless, that's the church that have that has kept itself. It, it kept itself from the ways of the world and the compromise and the idols and you know the the the, the drunkenness of the world it, it kept itself and it fought hard to make it to where it is in order to keep those garments clean listen do you know how hard it is to keep right garments clean it is very hard you have to be a person who's very intentional and very focused and so for the church to have endured persecution for the church to have you know, endure different things like adversity, opposition, losing people, losing friends and, and family, being persecuted, being hated by all men for Christ's sake. That's big. Being able to dodge all of these things and endure to overcome, to persevere. That's a representation of the garments being clean and staying clean. And so this is why it says she has arrayed herself in fine linen and they are clean and white. Yeah, they have kept their garments clean because they knew where they were going. They knew where they were invited to. And in this place, you have to look the part. You have to look a certain way. God has to be able to recognize you. You have to be recognizable. And the way that you are recognizable is if you look like him. How do I look like God, Sister Liberty? Because aren't we all made in the image and the likeness of God? Listen, the more I spend time with God, the more I begin to look like God. I begin to hate what God hates and I begin to love what God loves. I no longer have excuses to where I say God is still working with me or God knows my heart. No, if I am really desiring to be where God is, then I have to live daily as a real Christian. I have to live daily a lifestyle that's submitted to God, that's pleasing to God. So my day-to-day -day activities, my day-to-day -day should look a certain way. It should look like someone who is striving, not someone who's already made decisions to go and sin. No, that's not 
that's not a real Christian because we feel as though where everyone sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I've always said that there is a difference, especially for those who want to say, well, everybody's a sinner. No, that's not what the word of God calls those of us that have been born again. I am not a sinner. I do not go out and intentionally sin. I do not make plans to sin. I do not make plans in my mind to go out and do wickedly. I refrain as the word of God tells us to do. I refrain myself from evil. And if I fall, let's say this situation stirred up my emotion. And let's say in that moment, my emotions slipped out of my hand. Instead of me gripping them and getting control over them and putting them in subjection, I allowed my emotions to get the best of me. That's me falling short. But then the word of God says that a just man falls and gets back up. And so I can come back from that. I can get up from that. I'm, I, I don't have to stay down and feel as though, well, since I fell, I might as well just continue on sinning. No, that's the mindset of a sinner, not a saint. And so there is a difference. And so if I am pushing, striving, fighting daily to please the Lord, then I'm going to become, he's going to give me power to become like him. He's going to give me power to look like him. When people see me, they're going to see light. They're going to see godliness. The word of God says, let your light so shine. My light, there's going to be a light on me that's going to attract people. They're going to see godliness. They're going to see goodness. They're going to be able to see, man, there is something different about this person. This person looks different from the rest of the world. It's because of the glory of God on me. And the power that God has given me to be changed and to change so that I can be with him forever. Because when I see him, I have to look like him. I can't stand before God and God say, I do not know you. Wait a minute. How, how do you not know me? Then you have those in Matthew 7 who feels, Lord, Lord, hold on now, Lord. I know you, Lord. Lord, I know you know me because I did a lot of things for you. I did a lot of great things for you. I healed the sick. I raised the dead. I cast out many devils in your name. And so I know my name is in that book somewhere. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You do not have on the garments for this occasion right here. No, you knew about this occasion. You, you knew that I was coming. You knew that the bride was coming just like the foolish virgins in Matthew 25. No, you knew he was coming. You decided to not take extra oil. I don't know what your mindset was or what it was telling you. Apparently, it wasn't a mindset that says I must be prepared and, and keep myself adorned and keep myself pure and clean. It was a mindset that says I have time. It was a mindset that says he knows my heart. It was a mindset that says, well, maybe he'll adjust the rules. Maybe he'll switch it up for me because he knows me and I've done a lot for him. And he's going to say, I, I do not know you. I do not recognize you. How is he going to be able to say that? Because you don't look like him. Yeah. The word of God says, can a... Like a, a mother forget her, her baby. Can she forget her own child? No, I know that. I know that that's my baby. Why? Because that baby looks like me. Now that child, I don't know. It makes me think about the two women. And I believe, what is it? First Kings. And I might be, I might be uh, mixing scriptures. But it makes me think about the two prostitutes that both of them had babies. One of them rolled over on her baby. She went into the other room took the other lady's baby, and when that one woke up, she was trying to figure out whose baby is this. This baby does not look like me. I know this baby is dead, but at the same time, this baby does not look like me. And so they went before Solomon, and there was a, there was a back and forth. There was an altercation about whose baby it was, but the one whose baby it really was, she was able to identify, no, this is my baby. I know what my baby looks like. At first, when I noticed that the baby was dead and I looked at the baby, I noticed that the baby was not mine. It's her baby. And so, in the end, you know, Solomon said, let's split the baby in half. The, the actual mother was like, you know what, just give the baby to her. Why? Because she wanted her to live. But the point that I was making is that she was able to recognize her own. God is going to recognize his own. And so, if you do not look like him, then you cannot spend forever with him. That's the point that I wanted to make. It says, and he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called on to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You are blessed. You've been called. Many are called. So I've invited many people to my wedding, but only few came. Those who were ordained to come, ordained to be there, they came, they showed up. And everybody had on their garments because they knew where they were going. You knew you were coming to a marriage. You knew you were coming to a wedding. Why do you not have on the right garments? 
Why? What told you? Who told you that it was okay for you to come another way? You can only get through the door, but you have to look a certain way. It can't be what you want it to be. Maybe that person felt as though, well, the master of the wedding, he's going to have to accept me the way that I am. Listen, this is this is all me. This is me. If he can't accept me as me, then I don't know what to tell him. You got people that think like that. Well, God made me this way. God made me, you know, to be a man and desire man. God made me to want to have all of these tattoos. God made me to want to have all of these piercings. God made my body this way. And so I can show it up. I show off what my mama gave me because God made me this way. I've heard people say, and if God doesn't like it, then he's going to have to deal with it. That's probably how the, how the guy felt who had on the wrong garments. He probably felt that way. Like, listen, this is me. He's going to have to accept me. If God can't accept me, then I don't know. He made me this way. And that is not true. We know that God didn't make us that way because God doesn't look like that. God doesn't look like the world. How do we know that's just liberty? Because the word of God tells us that God is holy. God is holy. And that there's order and there's structure in heaven. There's worship in heaven. There is not rap. There's not concerts. There's not drama. There might be some war. <laughs> there might be some war, but they're not walking around with Nikes and Converse's and J's on their feet. People are not in heaven wearing halter tops and crop tops and skinny jeans and, you know, shorts hanging below their waist. Like people, we don't understand that the world has really messed us up. And so we look at God and I've heard people say, yeah, you know, God is my homeboy. God is my dog. Me and God. We tight, we cool. Me and God, you know, we see eye to eye, you know, and they, they don't realize who they're actually talking about. They don't realize the God that they're actually dealing with. You cannot go to England and disrespect the queen. Well, well, now the king. I think King Charles is in reign now. But you cannot go to England and you may feel like you know the king because you followed his life. For the last 20 years. So you may feel like you know him like that. He don't know you. But you may feel entitled. You may feel as though that's your place. That's going to get you killed. Having the wrong response. Not knowing who you're dealing with. Is going to get you killed. So if you don't know who you're dealing with. If you don't know that you're dealing with a holy God. The, the same God who has be, who has uh, breathed breath into your lungs. If you don't know that you're dealing with that kind of God. Then you're going to find yourself. Dead. You're going to find yourself out of his presence eternally. And so you better know who you're dealing with and who you're messing with. You don't, you don't play with God. You don't try God. You don't think that you're greater than God. You better learn how to humble yourself. You better read Daniel. You better read Daniel and figure out what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar when he thought of himself more highly than he ought, he ought to. I believe someone in the New Testament's reference Nebuchadnezzar like yeah remember this person if you humble yourself God will exalt you but if you try to exalt yourself you will be brought down low you will be brought a bait and that's what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar wait a minute you don't know who I am I know I set up kings in the earth but I am king of kings and lord of lords that's on Jesus garments king of all kings and lord of all lords that's a glory that's a that's a glory that shows who he is, that he reigns supreme. He's over all. Yeah, that word Lord of Lord, that means he's Lord over all. That word King of Kings, he's King over all. God of gods, he's God over all. No one is above him. No one is beneath him. That's why I can say that he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so we have to know who we are dealing with. And we have to make sure that our garments are fit for where we are going. Yeah, people have on garments that are fit for hell, ready for hell. People are dressed in the spirit. Make no mistake about it. People are dressed for that because I believe it says it in Revelation 16 or 17 where the angel says to John, you know, keep your garments clean lest you are naked in shame. They, they, see, they see your garments and how they're not clean and they're not pure. Let me go to it real quick. So your garments look like something in the spirit. 
Everybody is not dressed the same. People are dressed for where they are going to spend eternity. That's where people are dressed for. Let me see. I'm not going to spend too much long trying to find it. If I can't find it, then that's fine. But it, it says that. It says less. Hold on. Maybe right here. Okay. Uh, I guess I can't find it right now. But yes, he says, let your garments be, or you be naked and shame. So you are dressed for where you are going eternity. Those who are going to spend forever with God, they are already dressed. They are already being dressed. They are already being prepared and ready to go to this marriage feast. Their garments are clean and spotless. But those, was that it? Yes, thank you, Brother Joseph. Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keep his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So the, in the spirit, your garments are already seen. They can already see what you have on. Just like the Pharisees, how Jesus says, you look one way on the outside, but on the inside is something else. That's why I said, you know, you, you can't just have, have your garments look away on the outside and on the inside. Your heart looks a different way because that's possible. That's possible for me to be one who I'm best dressed. Every time I step out the house, I'm best dressed so I can look the part. And so we don't want to just look the part. We want to be the part. No, I want to be a reflection of what my garments are are showing and what they are saying and that has to be my heart my heart is a reflection of my garments and so that has to be us our garments have to be spotless and clean without dirt without residue without spots on them our garments have to remain clean and we do that by continuing to walk with God daily not just on Sundays not just on the holidays every single day my life has to be totally surrendered to God. My life has to be his. I die to self and I take up my cross so that I can gain life in the life to come. In Jesus name.